Hello, and welcome to another in my series of interviews where I'm talking to one of our many senior accredited researchers from around the world. My name's Paul Blunden. I'm founder of UX 24 7, and we help product owners, designers, and researchers deliver high performing products and services. Right, let's get stuck straight in and meet my guest today. Right, hello, Julia. Thank you for giving up your time to speak with me today. Um, can I ask by, uh, or start by asking you to introduce yourself? What's your name and whereabouts are you located? So, hi, I am Julia Stoll and I am um, based in Berlin currently. Um, but I actually move around uh, quite a lot uh, for work or during work. So, um, especially since COVID, I've been working um, remotely from different places in Europe. So lucky me. <laughs> so that's Very lucky. Kind of a... <laughs> and do you, uh, I take it if you're moving around different places in Europe, you, you're multilingual? A lot of our researchers are. Yes. Yeah, I do. I am. I, I do speak uh, four languages, five if you want. So, so it's English, French, uh, Italian. Um, that's my roots, Italian, German and Swiss German because I... I'm from Switzerland originally, so I grew up in Switzerland partially. Um, if you want to, I mean, Swiss Swiss people tend to say that Swiss German is an official, uh, it is an official language, so I should name it as a fifth language, but it is very similar to German. <laughs> from German. And presumably you run research in a lot of those languages, do you? Yes, yeah, I do, yeah. Well, that must be uh, fascinating. And um can you tell me, Julia, how did, well, how and why did you get into research? Well, long story. So um, I, I come from a creative background, um, more specifically a design background. So I, I, I did um, study in that context. Um, so um, coming from like a more in, like in the back in the days, product design, industrial design, um, it's been a long time since uh, since since I had my the honor to to do studying <laughs> in, in um, yeah these these times, but um, uh, so from the beginning actually research always has been kind of crucial to my work um, in the sense of like just understanding a problem at its root and then developing concepts to solve that problem and I think. Um, that idea kind of translates to my work today, which is not anymore, you know, like I'm, I'm not into, uh, I'm not doing any industrial design anymore, um, obviously, uh, but, you know, like it still kind of translates to that. So that's quite interesting. So there's this kind of red thread of research and uh, was that, that obviously kind of became more specific Um I did I did a master's degree uh, where I focused more on on product design and management, and where I started off with uh, with the entire like let's say service design approach. Um, again, focusing uh, a lot on research, becoming more like user centric or UX research back then, and um, but then always kind of interested in in scientific. Um, and in science and scientific facts. So I did kind of a, had my little um, private investigation and also my master thesis actually back then was more on speculative design. So really creating um, storylines and, and narratives based on science and scientific facts. So basically developing a storytelling uh, through products and scenarios and how, how to address certain topics in society. So always this question of understanding society, understanding um, perspectives, different people's perspectives and trying to translate those into back then a product or a work. Um, now it's insights and, you know, like concepts and um, yeah. That's fascinating. So many yeah. of our, um, well, of my colleagues over the years have come from an industrial design or ergonomics background. And I think it must be because they are so sort of vested in research that people sort of get into it and then carry on. Yeah, I think I'm not the only one, right? So there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, that have this background or originate from that background. And then for some reason, end up like in, in, in either research or consulting, you know, that's kind of but some often very inter interlaced. So yeah, that's actually, I, I, for me, it's a very natural, it has been a very natural uh, development, to be honest. And uh, back then, like looking back um, during there were phases, of course, where I was like 
why am I standing here now? And I, you know, I started off somewhere completely uh, different. And, you know, I also did studies. I, I studied also um, uh, history of art. So, you know, kind of, yeah, academia was always a big part in my, in my um, uh, life as a student, let's say, but, uh, and after that too, but not, it's, not so much anymore. <laughs> well, it sounds like you wouldn't have time, but uh... <laughs> And um, in terms of the research you've done, do you have a, a favorite methodology that you, you enjoy using or one that really sort of delivers for you? Yeah, well, I do, you know, like as maybe mentioned earlier on, it's like this kind of foundational uh, research, really understanding, um, well, users' universes in that sense, um, understanding, uh, uh, like when I when I'm able to, work on a project that really focuses on this base and trying to grasp okay whom whom are we doing this product or developing this service for and 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 what are the you know like this kind of initial understanding what are the the main um questions that we need to answer by but with our product um that is that is i mean this is kind of like uh carte blanche so like wide a wild card you know like you, you just kind of get to kind of find out the questions that need to be asked and like be in the field spending time with users that's what i um, users not not users then yet maybe but um people or target groups potential target groups so really actually framing uh like scoping like framing the 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 people uh, you you want to, or the groups you want to be talking to, um, or you want to be doing your research with, it doesn't have to be like you know in depth interviews all the time. It can be cultural probes, super interesting. I love preparing actually, like prepping all these things and then spending time in the field, getting back with it. So like really these kind of the, the beautiful projects that take research projects that take a long time that are very um, you know not the, the <laughs> <laughs> the less the least expensive ones <laughs> so they're you know like tend to be quite rare nowadays unfortunately um but i think there's a lot of value in there uh and so yeah companies who have the the luck to um to have a budget or to, to free budgets for such for, for that type of research i think it's it's extremely uh valuable for for the entire like or throughout, you know, like throughout the entire, it's actually material that you can get back to uh, even years later. So if if it's done well, you know. So yeah, you you mentioned cultural probes there. I think. What do you mean by that? Yeah, sorry, that may be a term that isn't in, 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 used in German in German context. So it's maybe it could be it's like diary um, studies, you know, like where you have people observe themselves. Um, uh, so yeah, you may you know like uh, invite them to um, um, for on a specific topic. You know maybe I don't know like let's say someone with um, just saying anything now diabetes. So that's maybe the 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 the, the group you you'll be looking at a uh, group of people, and so you'll ask that person to kind of observe uh, the you know the, the the touch points or the moments where where. Um, that person will be you know using maybe um the medication or like how that person is actually eating throughout the day uh what's the you know what's the habits so really kind of doing that on a very um like inviting people to observe themselves without like telling them what to do you know like to have this kind of um free approach and that and using the what comes back as a base to develop the interview guide and then have inter, in-depth interviews after that that's beautiful okay. when you, you when you get to do that <laughs> In, indeed Super and you valuable. mentioned about that sort of discovery research I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with the design council's double diamond but exactly that divergent stage it's, that one, the, the beginning it's, exactly yeah, yeah. It, exactly it's yeah. Uh, but it's so infrequent we get the opportunity to do it these days people a lot of brands seem to sort of leap straight to the idea and then only go into evaluation rather than sort of left of the idea and and maybe find out a bit more but um, exactly that's I mean an understandable you know that there's I mean it's most of the times it's budgetary questions and also mindset that you know is still but we'll talk about that maybe uh, <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Later, later, later point. <laughs> yeah and obviously you've got really wide uh sort of in, uh, interests have you uh, worked across uh, many market sectors 
Yes, I have actually. Uh, I've 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 been trying to narrow down a little bit uh, in the past two years, um, but I have covered a lot of you know like from I don't know let's say um, healthcare, yeah, insurances. I don't know telecommunication, mobility, um, uh, automotive, but also like non-automotive mobility, um, uh, renewable energies. That's something that I'm focusing more on uh, these days. Um, uh, femtech, uh, fintech, uh, yeah, etc. Sounds like et a long, so, a yeah, long pretty list. Pretty broad, <laughs> yeah. And are you focusing on green tech because that's an area that you really enjoy? Exactly. It's it's just I'm I'm like uh, I feel like I have the responsibility to be supporting um, products or developments uh, of products that are uh, you know in line with with my personal values, um, uh, in my like my values in my private life. So I uh, I try to kind of uh, yeah to translate that to my work and. Uh, it actually works quite well if you position yourself you can you know it, it it it's it's doable um it's not always easy but it is doable and i think there are a lot of uh companies out there anyhow who are trying to you know like uh, to to move towards um, let's say socially sustainable products or um uh, ecological so sustainable products or, or or services and uh that is i think that is you know something that is worthwhile supporting um yeah without i i agree yeah. and they come in all <laughs> shapes and sizes we we've, we've just been working on a project for one of our banking clients who mm. are creating an app to help their customers be more carbon um neutral which and so mm. there is a real ecosystem i think it's yeah. uh providing a lot of opportunities perhaps yeah. that there weren't okay, before exactly. yeah. and um I mean, Ches, we talked a bit about sort of uh, discovery research and that those projects are few and far between. Um, I'm really interested to understand a bit more about the maturity of your market, which for you, I'm not sure which market that is because you're so sort of multi-European. Um, but I don't know how, which markets you can speak to about really how customer centric you think they are and the brands within them are. Yeah, uh, it's actually a super interesting question uh, or kind of a, a topic to think about, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, aspects to that. Um, so, I I mean, I do, uh, so maybe to just kind of explain a little bit more, I have a lot of uh, clients and customers that are um, uh, based uh, in Germany, but also operating internationally. So sometimes research will be an international research, research but maybe, you know, like uh, commissioned by um, a company based in Germany. Uh, or it may be uh, like uh, really companies in Switzerland or Italy or France, etc. Or uh, by the way, uh, the UK too. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so actually, um, I, I would now maybe talk about the German because I, I did work before becoming uh, working as a freelancer. I did work in a in an agency in Berlin uh, for quite uh, quite a while. So. I do have a lot of, you know, I have I had a lot of um, impressions from the German market, of course, also by mainly living here. So, you know, I get to see a lot. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I've had the chance to, to work with a few of the main of those main major German brands um, over the time, over the years. And I have to say um, there is there clearly is a willingness, you know, to be customer centric, um, at least uh among some of the commissioning departments always you know it's not always company wide but there is a willingness and also an interest and awareness to push customer centricity um <clears throat> i also think um that you know there's there's this tendency that a lot of companies uh, corporate structures here in germany they are building like probably you know it's, it's happening worldwide but they're building their own ux teams so that sh shows also at least that again there's an awareness that this customer centricity or user centricity is of value to the brands you know in the long run um but that's where you know the big butt <laughs> comes in like um there is often a big stretch that's to my to my experience there's often a big stretch 
between this good intention and this interest in kind of bringing customer centricity into product or into even like into a culture and a company culture and the actual implementation. So that's the, you know, that's the tricky part is how to implement that, how to really um, cultivate that um, customer centricity because it's often something that is very deeply connected to the culture of a company. And um, so you can't just, you know, like copy paste something onto it. It has to grow from within. So yeah, that's, that's I think that is kind of a, a challenge that a lot of companies also are aware of and are trying to face. So I think it's, yeah, it's interesting field to be working in, let's say, let's say put it that way. <laughs> it, it sure is. And it's, I've, I've said this to a couple of people I've interviewed, but it's it all seems strange when you've been in this industry for 20 years and you believe so much in the value that there's still this kind of educational problem that, that uh, it's only in pockets that companies get it, but yeah. um, I'm sure yeah. one day they'll get there, but yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, with with those brands, what do you think the greatest challenge for them and and for product directors is when they're sort of undertaking UX research or a, an individual study? Even um, well, you know, I'd say it's it it always starts with the very beginning. So it's really getting the scope and the research strategy right. It's really kind of what questions like to, you know to put it on a high level like what questions should we be asking ourselves <laughs> or what should we what is what is actually our challenge what's actually the the the, the topic um that needs to be um tackled you know and um from there you know understanding okay what do we need to find out in order to get there and 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 how can we actually get there so it's it's kind of really taking the time I think that's a challenge you know like taking the time the effort putting the effort into the the starting the, the starting point and the scoping of things and uh, obviously we have like very often budget restriction budgetary restrictions um, are a big problem or a big constraint let's say um, also I think also due to the fact that you know like the relevance of qualitative especially qualitative research by the way um quantitative not so much uh, is is it's it still has in some for some in some contexts and um, this this kind of yeah it's it's not it, it's a relevance that is 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 being questioned all uh, from time to time let's <laughs> put it you know to say like put it mildly um so a lot of i've i've faced a lot of situations where where, you know, like, okay, uh, we need to shorten budgets. Uh, okay, research gets kicked out, basically, you know, like when I was still working as a service designer, so where I was really, where research, user research was just one part of the of the entire bigger um, projects that I would kind of cover. And that was always like, it's it's it always seemed like so absurd to kick out qualitative research, you know, when there's when it's so crucial <laughs> to 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 developing a good a good service but that and that is a challenge that you know like um so and i think that has to do a lot with with different factors but also amongst uh, amongst one of the the bigger ones i think is really the um the status of the value of qualitative research because it's not numbers you know it's not binary and that makes it really hard to to place into in 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 corporate structures where numbers are mostly leading that's kind of i think that the challenge that you know like product directors who are probably aware of that you know that they're they're kind of they're they're yeah um tackling or or maybe maybe even struggling with i don't know um well, it, I think you could be right. I mean, the if you look at what we were discussing earlier around discovery research, you know, one of the reasons people don't do it is, and obviously that is a lot qualitative, is the results of it are so far down the line that, you, you know, how do you you connect the two things together? And yeah, it, it's a real challenge, isn't it? When you because it does take a leap of faith rather than a measurable thing because nobody ever measures. Oh, well, we got it right, so therefore we're selling more. I mean, yeah, there is the effort, of course, to kind of make it measurable, right? So, uh, but but that is that is 
again that's not with the with not the discovery phase it's it's later on probably um, when you have an actual product and you can do usability testings and you can and then you can start you know like having measurements uh putting measurements in place and even there again very very tricky uh to to get that right right so um i, I think that is also very often underestimated and and um um yeah, but that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, let, oh, yeah. let's let's move the uh, conversation over to something a bit more positive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, perhaps you could share with me um, a flagship project that you've worked on and and a bit about that. Um, yeah, I think I mean a project. It's I mean there's there's a couple of projects that I you know I'd, I'd like to kind of be talking about. Obviously, there's there's been quite a few really interesting ones that I, I, I was I got lucky to, to participate in but there's one project I think that's kind of interesting also in the in the context of, of this of this conversation here is um uh, was a project in the context of health insurance um so the the client was actually so it was it happened during our in the, in the beginning of uh the digital transformation of the entire company so this means like um, internal structures and processes, but also the customer facing ones. So it's really kind of um, health insurance going from paper to, you know, going digital. Um, so uh, this was a, a very big and also cultural transformation, by the way, because it's, a you know, like uh, meaning like, okay, all the internal processes are going digital or arch, are, they are, Many of them were, of, of course, already digital, but like kind of, um, you know, flattening out and smoothing out the those kind of um, uh, interactions between uh, the employees and uh, the customers, right? Because health insurance, as you may uh, know, we all know from, from our own experience, you know, you have to call them, you have to talk to them, then you have to send in papers, you have to, you know, like in order to get your money, maybe um, to get reimbursed for some medical uh, um, procedures, etc. cetera. Um, so in that context, um, there was a, a, a also a foundational, like, kind of many different research um, activities going on, but also one who was really focusing on understanding um, the process of uh, handing in uh, your medical invoices uh, for reimbursement or uh, cost estimates. And so in, in uh, you know, like, I don't, it's, it's a bit different from country to country, but um, in Germany, um, you know, for instance, when you have like your teeth, uh, when you get your teeth fixed, <laughs> you will get a cost estimate, um, uh, and uh, because there's there's only it's only partially you know like taken on by the by the um, by the health insurance. So um, kind of these things are costly, you know. So teeth are always kind of important and and expensive. So um, so that was kind of a topic where we just we took that topic to focus on uh, or that. Kind of let's say that um, interaction uh, with the with the tooth topic, uh, amongst others, um, to really understand um, well what is going on there actually, and and because we know it's kind of a process that isn't flowing quite right at the moment. So okay, what's what's going on internally and externally? So the research really focused on talking to customers, but also um, doing the, the entire um, research also internally with employees, um, mapping out the processes, um, you know, like huge blueprints of like how to kind of out how the current process is and the blueprint actually how to the process that how it should be in the end, you know. Um, big project. Um, and actually what was super interesting is um, that there were like very clear pain points uh, on the outside and on the inside. So, you know, customers would say, okay, this all takes too long. It can be months until, you know, you know, if you get the money or not. And I need to know if I can get the money back because otherwise I can't do my, I can't, I don't know, I can't do my, my medical, um, um, I always lack the word here. Um, yeah, or I've I've been in hospital and you know now I have to pay by myself, but I don't know like I have to come up with the money and you know it's sometimes really like crucial moments of like financial important uh, moments because it's a lot of money often involved. Yeah. So um, like this can take too long. 
But at the same time, internally, they were saying, yeah, uh, the system is so outdated or frustrating. We lose, we have a lot of blockers, technical blockers. So we lose time. So everyone was losing time. And um, so it was really interesting to kind of then during the process of development. So the, the idea was um, then that the, based on those insights, the, there was an app or actually the functionality that was developed um, for, that would allow for a digital transfer of receipts and estimates and faster confirmation on reimbursement, which meant actually, you know, especially actually a reset or a complete change of the backend process. So that was a, a super, super, uh, um, I, I mean, you know, like front end, it was like obviously the app, yeah, but there was already an app and there was a lot of work there to be done because this functionality was added on. But really the backend process um, actually was really re revolutionary in the end for the entire company and was taken on for other, uh, other areas, other uh, departments too later on. But um, just based on these kind of understandings. Um, and also, again, here, taking on and having kind of this um, ongoing conversation and ongoing involvement of the employees uh, and kind of, okay, so then, you know, from the from the initial phase, you would kind of then develop prototypes and look and have them kind of do the user usability testings in that sense with them and have feedback on that and um to you know up to kind of building the mvp and launching that and then going live and then kind of etc cetera, etc cetera. so it was a two-year project um and i was on and off but actually for one and a half years i was on the project so it was really uh really intense and actually it's i'm i'm happy about it because it's a project where there were actual you know, the output is really clear. <laughs> um, they've gone from paper to digital, like it's kind of a clear, they, they have shortened uh, times, uh, waiting times. So it's it's pretty positive. Um, yeah, so that's, it's actually a cool, was was a quite cool project. Even if it's, you know, like if you, if you would say from a maybe researcher, like, okay, insurances, it's like always like, okay, but... <laughs> Was a really attractive project. <laughs> finally, uh, the financial services sector are often some of the most in interesting um, projects or engagements, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and I love the idea of, of saving time. I do wonder whether, as a currency of what research delivers, one of the biggest things is time saving, actually, uh, particularly in B2B, mm -hmm. um, sure. but also obviously in B2C. And when you get in a back end system, that's Fascinating. I think it's often the case that the consumers believe that in that scenario, the, the organization wants to delay it, but actually often they don't yeah, do that. It's, exactly. It's yeah, just exactly. their own systems holding totally, them up. Totally that point. Uh, yeah. And also, and also actually kind of the, the fear also for some, you know, it's also being um, a lot of people actually when they work in 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 certain in departments they're in contact with the customers right so they have to they talk to them they're in contact with them they have to explain why things are delayed or not and so and and they value this kind of they value the interaction with the customers but then they always have to kind of they're always bringing up like negative you know like it's always frustrating the the information they have so it's also not you know it's not really <laughs> it doesn't make feel anyone good either neither the the customer nor the nor the the clerk let's say who's who's actually talking to the person yeah In, double pain. <laughs> good stuff thank you and um I'm, I'm really interested to ask you this question but i i've asked everybody about this the sort of behaviors or the unique behaviors to the market um, and things that perhaps you'd recommend global brands pay attention to if they're entering the markets you work in. Obviously, you've worked in a number of markets. Um, so, yes, yeah, keen to ask you this one. Yeah, actually, it's, it's tricky, difficult to say because it's obviously I am not German. So I have this kind of take on like, you know, like, oh, this is really for me, like, oh, this is probably very German because, you know, <laughs> like behavior wise, because it's just something that I may not be you know like be uh, uh yeah familiar with let's say but then also it's obviously I've been living here for eight years so almost no seven years whatever so it's like I've, I've gotten to you know um appreciate a lot of those behaviors too anyhow um uh, I think I think what is interesting also in working like what I see 
coming up in projects um, and and um, it's pretty this uh, the topic of data security is is really like Germany they is really um, I would say leading uh, in terms of like they're very strict when it comes to data security um, uh, but that's you know like you have the GDPR aspect to it but there's also this kind of awareness of what is happening to my data so this is not something that is you know like forcibly imposed by the by the state but it's really something that i feel I've, I've observed is there is much more there's a lot of awareness concerning uh what happens to my data um uh you know when i use this app or i don't let, download this or is this kind of you know like um appropriate etc like to whatever you know there's so many situations where you're going to be sharing your data proactively or passively um and uh, that is something that i've 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 really noticed that is uh pretty interesting because it's really it's remarkably um, present where i would say i mean i can't you know like value or i can't really call it i can't compare directly of course but um i haven't noticed it elsewhere that that um in that expression let's say <laughs> that it, it, it's funny seeing international research we work in some markets where people sort of tick the boxes and like yeah i don't care what they're doing with my data you know they can have it they've probably got it already um and so it's really interesting when you see the contrast yeah. with a, a market where uh, well i've been in research in germany where they've read every term and condition yeah. on the contract you know yeah. and it's it's, yeah. it's really a stark yeah. difference yeah, I mean, it's not, it's obviously there's, of course, a lot of people who live in Germany who are, you know, not, who are, who don't care. Huh? That's for sh that's clear, you know, I'm not, I don't want to say this is everyone, but this is really a tendency. It's interesting. And, and it's also a tendency that is obviously kind of reproduced by the companies because it's something that is often communicated as kind of, a, a, you know, like an, a, a positive asset of, you know, when, when, like in communication and so on, it's, it's really, it's kind of, it's it's out there. It's enhanced. Um, uh, it's part of the tone of voice, often, you know, like in communication. Um, so that's 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 quite interesting. Very, very. Yeah, and it's also. I mean, I guess it's you know, if it's if it's a if it's a seamless process for for both uh, users and 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 uh, providers in that sense. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's it's obviously something to support. You know, I'm 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 very supportive of that. Um, yeah. Good. And um, I've, I've had a lot of your time, Julia, so I'll uh, wrap oh, up with fine. the last couple of questions. Can you tell me what's inspiring you at the moment? Um, <laughs> so many things. Uh, I'm, I'm, so I have to say during COVID, sitting in my, uh, uh, you know, like not going to the, the, to the, to see the clients anymore that much and being like, you know, restricted to home office situations. I think a lot of us know that. Um, uh, it's been it's become even more important for me to go out into nature. So it's a lot of um, hiking and um, and all these things that ha that are really inspiring, even if it's very, very plain to say that nature is inspiring. <laughs> I think everyone can maybe relate to that. <laughs> but it is uh, it has proven uh, its high value to me <laughs> over the past years. Um, <clears throat> So this is also uh, why I try to kind of, you know, not always work from Berlin, but um, try to work from, I don't know, Swiss mountains or uh, <laughs> where else that may be. Um, but like in terms of, uh, yeah, um, inspiration. Otherwise, I I've, I take a lot of inspiration uh, from non-work, meaning I do projects that are not um, where I'm... <laughs> This, I would say that the main difference is that I'm, I don't earn any money with. It's really kind of projects that are <laughs> motivated by uh, pure curiosity and interest and uh, working with good with people that I, I like working with um, that are super smart and have interesting approaches and perspectives. And um, so we're kind of uh, continuously like, you know, like um, grouping, uh, getting together with other with with like that currently we're a group of four um and and diving into um all from a similar background uh diving into like the uh, topic of um let's say the the fringe of where qualitative research or ux research 
meets uh, investigative journalism and um, all the different media involved and how to kind of the question of like research insights, you know, that often sadly end in a report and that's it, you know. Um, are there ways to kind of open up these insights to like maybe not only the the actual company um, and and you know like the whomever you know like is is meant to be seeing the report or the the insights, um, but have a different approach to that and those questions. We're currently kind of you know doing research, obviously, <laughs> but also prototyping stuff. So that is really inspiring because it's yeah it's just motivating to see that there's a lot of uh just a lot of possibilities there and there's a lot of interest it started as soon as you start talking about uh these projects and these ideas to to um people or or or, or organizations um there's always an interest in kind of uh taking it you know to to do like a step step further in a way um that's uh, I love the idea of that reimagining the kind of way research is delivered and I can see why yeah. that would be inspiring yeah yeah. And finally, Julia, what's your biggest learning since you became a researcher? Um, yeah, so I I would say um the main thing is that um for me it's like being a researcher is obviously always paired with curiosity about people, right? And curiosity, um being interested in understanding how things work, how systems actually function. And um and I've I've really observed and also again within during a project that I led during COVID we did a, a side project where we were actually really investigating this what what's the effect of the isolation and the lockdown on people and um, so we had a, a big research going on and uh, one of the main takeouts was really you know finding it and again confirming that we all live in our like not all but a lot of us, we live in our social bubbles, you know, they're very comfy though. Uh, like, and we have pers our perspective on things and the world within this bubble that may be a social, con you know, like constellation, family, friends, you know, the people you, you, you kind of interact with on a daily basis. And we are kind of circling in this bubble and we're by kind of moving around in this bubble and saying bubble, you know, it sounds like a little bit bubbly, but <laughs> in this, in this con context, we always confirm ourselves in our beliefs over and over our realities you know we're not questioning that much it's kind of it's kind of this safe thing it's this bubble it's this safe space of of beliefs and perspectives and um but there's actually so many bubbles you know out there <laughs> we're all in different bubbles so um i think if you don't know, like learning what i would say is it's really um important to be aware of that and proactively open up to others perspectives and bubbles from time to time because i think if we kind of continue moving within our bubbles and just kind of maybe even ignoring or disapproving that's often the fact you know disapproving of the perspectives and bubbles of others opinions that that may you know be coming from those other um, um belief systems um they they don't really in the end you know like don't really help confronting those many challenges that we're facing currently as a society. And I think this is my personal belief, but I think when it comes to making it possible, you know, to our like descendants <laughs> to live a responsible and fulfilled life, I think it's our responsibility to also kind of not always say that the reality I am living is the right thing and is the reality, but there are so many out there. And, you know, like, and this as a researcher, because I have to immerse myself into completely different contexts and scenarios and universes, people's worlds and belief systems, you know, all in all and over again, um, makes me get in contact with these different belief systems. And um, actually, I think the learning is, you know, um, not to judge, but simply to listen <laughs> and to kind of, you know, like um, try to take it on a different, at a different level and work with it at a different level than just judging it or disapproving of it. Yeah, very deep. <laughs> well, but I think I, it's, uh, yeah, it's a life learning, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a really inspirational perspective, actually, not just a learning. And thank you for sharing it with us. I think people will be really interested to hear. And uh, thanks for, for giving up your time, Julia. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, and learning you. more about you. I know we've worked together, but it's I learned a lot on these interviews. And uh, yeah, fascinating hearing about your career, what you've been up to and everything else. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I hope you enjoyed that interview with Julia, uh, learning more about her work and what inspires her and what she's learned from being a researcher. Um, I know I, I really enjoyed that. Um, my name is Paul Blunden. I'm founder of UX 24-7, and we help global brands, product owners, researchers, designers uh, deliver high-performing products and services. If you want to find out more about what we do, um, please visit our website. That's ux247.com. Or hook me up on LinkedIn, uh, drop me a message there, happy to have a chat. Uh, and of course, subscribe to this channel and there'll be another interview coming along soon. Thanks for watching.